I just want to thank all of you for coming. It's such an honor to be reading here at Medgar Evers. Um, thank uh, President Jackson for hosting this event. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to Mr. Jenkins and the whole staff that put together this presidential lecture series. Um, and many, many thanks to Provost Nunez, who I'm honored to be reading with on stage. It's quite a pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm going to be reading from my story that's in this text called Trinidad Noir. I'm going to be reading from the last story, which is mine. Um, the story, its frame is set in a coffin shop, a shop that, that actually sells caskets. And the owner of this coffin shop, his name is Corban, he's having a hard time selling recently. And so he decided to take some of this into his own hands. Um, so he might have better sales. Uh, my main character is Gita, and she is hanging out with her friend Leslie in the passage that I'm going to read to you. Gita's mother has recently passed away, and Gita decides that she's going to mourn her mother's passing by doing all the things her mother wouldn't let her do. So she starts wearing mini skirts. She starts dating boys that she wasn't allowed to date before. She starts going clubbing. She's in high school. She decides she's going to apply to college, do all kind of stuff that she um, wasn't allowed to do when her mom was alive. And the story is set in Shagarama. So I'm going to be reading from this section where uh, Gita, whose name is also Pinky, um, and her friend Leslie are getting ready to go to the club um, that's in Shagarama. My idea of the club is that it's Anchorage Club. Y'all know Anchorage? Some Trinities? Man, y'all need to go back home and go club in. Um, this um, piece starts with them getting ready. That night, Pinky wore a dress to match her name. A magenta dress that wasn't even hers. The sluttiest thing I own, said Leslie laughing. But Pinky didn't laugh. She looked at herself in the mirror and thought of her mother in her red wedding sari. In the picture, her father wore a European suit and had thick sideburns. Her father looked like a child of an era. Her mother looked errorless. She was not sure which was better. Now she looked at herself in the mirror and puckered. Her dress was spandex and it stuck and it stretched. It was open at the back and ended above the knees. There was a slit at the left thigh. Pinky thought that she would never look like this again. But in the next instant, she said out loud, this is what I always want to look like. The club was not the hot, smoky place she had expected. It was cool with AC inside, and there was a big balcony out by the water. Scope the place out first, shouted Leslie, as the entry bands were fastened around their wrists. Stay away from the nasty old men. They walked in. They kept their backs straight. They flipped their hair. Leslie had taught her the screw face. This club was about attitude. Don't smile unless you see someone you know, and then hug and air kiss. And if it's a guy, wait for him to offer a drink. Never say no to a free drink. And never buy your own drink. It was a masquerade. They were pretty. They were desirable. Everyone was supposed to know it. When you dance, make sure you're not dancing next to a girl who could dance better than you. <laughs> make sure to establish eye contact with a good looking man, but let him come over to you first. Dance when you're tired. Dance even if you're sweaty and tired. Take off your shoes if you need to. You can keep them behind at the DJ booth. Only stop dancing if a guy offers you a drink. And then ask for something good. What's good? Get like a sex on the beach, or a fuzzy navel, or a blowjob. No, don't get that. That's taking it too far. Never get what he's having. Mandrakes taste nasty. Like Long Island iced tea? That's disgusting. That's a get drunk drink. You just want to look good when you hold in a glass. In fact, stick to sex on the beach. It matches your dress. And me, I'll get blue lagoons all night. The old man against the walls watched the girls like a movie. Outside on the deck, Pinky and Leslie drank their colorful drinks bought by forgettable boys and cooled off with the sea breeze. Pinky's hair was plastered onto her face. It wasn't so hot inside, but they had been dancing and sweating. The DJ had played hip hop and rock, but not Calypso yet. Pinky didn't really know how to move to hip hop or rock. She was waiting for soca. They play it last, said Leslie. No Mateo, 
Gita said out loud and felt relieved, and then disappointed by her own relief. No Mateo yet, you wait, girl. Leslie lit a tiny black cigar with a plastic tip. She blew out over the balcony. When the bells and the knocking of Calypso came on, Leslie flicked her cigarillo over the side of the balcony and they left their drinks. Inside the dance floor was crowded. Women had their, skirt, their skirts hoisted up and men had their hands in the air. People were dancing in the corner by the tables and on top of the couches. Women leaned on the backs of chairs to steady themselves. Leslie and Pinky didn't look for empty space. They simply walked in and danced where they ended up. Pinky felt good now. She didn't need Mateo after all. She swung her hips and her heavy wet hair and then just like that, Mateo came up behind her as though it was something he did often. He had that rich, musky smell, and he held her hips in his hands as he pulled her body closer to his. Her first thought was, this is not right. Her next thought was, this is so right. <laughs> Everyone in the club was screaming the words to the song. Everyone was knocking hips into one another. The bass beat twice, and people stomped their feet twice. Pinky put her hands over Mateo so she could follow his rhythm. She looked around, realizing that Leslie was not beside her, but then there she was. A white girl was hard to miss in the dark club. <laughs> Leslie had her palms flat on the wall, her arms straight and stiff, and her backside was rolling on the crotch of a man who was old enough to act cool about the friction. It seemed so odd, all of this, all this display, all this. And after Christmas break, they'd be back in their class uniforms, and perhaps that was its own kind of pretend. Mateo turned her around so they faced each other. And though this was less vulgar because less of their bodies were touching, it seemed more intimate. He leaned his face into her neck, and she felt his lips on her wet skin, as if he had tapped directly onto her spine. She shivered and pulled back. And then she left the dance floor. Mateo stood there for a moment before following her out. You okay, he asked once they were outside. Yeah, you okay? Yeah, they were quiet for several moments. I wanted to kiss you in there, he said. I know. Can I, uh, can I kiss you now? I don't know. <laughs> can I try? She nodded. He leaned forward and she turned to give him her cheek. Pinky, if we get married, we're gonna be doing a lot more than kissing. <laughs> what? And then he kissed her open mouth and she felt his soft lips and his wet tongue and she jumped back and she smiled and backed away some more and then she ran away into the cavern of the club, her heels clinking on the deck like knocking bones. She'd had her first kiss and it had been with Mateo Diaz and had he asked her to marry him? This was like a Bollywood movie except with real kissing. She needed to talk to Leslie. But inside, the dance floor was a living mass of its own. It was hot and steamy now, and the people were not concerned about the expensiveness of their dresses or the intricateness of their hairdos. The floor was sticky and difficult to walk on in Leslie's heels. Mateo had kissed her, and now Gita did not know what to do. It had felt animal-like. It had felt slutty even. She didn't want to see him again, but she wanted to see him every day for the rest of her life. And that was silly. Did she really believe that Mateo Diaz was the kind of boy who kissed a girl and then married her? Was he? He would want sex first, or at least dating a little. He would want to fool around with American girls in college and all that, wouldn't he? Would he? Why would he say something so serious if he wasn't serious? She felt sick. Her head felt sick. She felt as though she had to get away from the crowd. Are you tight? Someone asked. She shook her head, but thought she might throw up. Man, Pinky Manachandi is tight. <laughs> she wandered to the bathroom, then hiked up her pink dress and sat on the toilet and felt as though the kiss and the drink were finally gone from her. When she emerged, she felt better but more stupid. Had she even kissed Mateo? And had she ran away afterwards? Someone grabbed her wrist gently. It felt protective. She looked up, expecting to see her father. The older man, not her father, leaned into her face. You don't look good. I'm not. You need some water. He was wearing a Panama hat, fitting tight and low. 
he offered her his open bottle. She wasn't used to drinking alcohol, so the water seemed like a savior. She took it and drank steadily, drank the whole bottle before she knew it. It felt clean, it tasted sweet. I'm sorry, sir. She handed him back the empty bottle. Sir, said the man with amusement. Well, I haven't been alive that much longer than you. Gita didn't know how to feel about this, but now she peered at him and thought he looked kind of familiar. She squinched up her eyes at him. It wasn't a bad feeling, this familiarity, but it felt dark like a secret. He squinched his eyes back at her. Then, without smiling or without saying goodbye, he slipped into the men's room with his empty water bottle. Where you been? Leslie's voice, suddenly next to hers, was hoarse. In the bathroom. You was puking? I don't know. Mateo, just tell me he kissed you, and then you run away. He's lying. Oh, man, Pinky, now what you gonna do? You like him like that? I gonna marry him. My dad will let me do anything. He visits with my dead mother at night. What are you talking about? Nothing. Are you boyfriend and girlfriend now? I don't think so. Gita watched the door of the men's room and waited for the man to come out. She wanted to remember who he was. You should find out, Leslie paused. Do you even have his number? Who? Oh no, I don't think so. Pinky, are you high or something? What the hell, go give him your number. They walked around the club that was now playing its jazzy theme song. People were leaving, the lights went on like a wide search beam. People looked human and raw. Some stood around and waited. Others talked loudly about heading out to a new club in Port of Spain that stayed open later. No one was dancing anymore. The dance floor looked like a sad, dirty place. Mateo wasn't there. Outside, they stumbled over the pebbles to Pinky's car. I'll drive, Leslie offered. That's okay, said Pinky. She sat in the driver's seat of the SUV that had been her mother's. She started the engine and rolled down the windows with the automatic buttons. Hey, Pinky, stop running away from me, girl. Ooh, whispered Leslie from the passenger seat. Mateo, good. Pinky put the car back in park and told her heart to stop slamming against the inside of her chest. Asked her brain to stop floating around in her head. She wanted really to drive away. She wanted really to wave and honk her horn like the others were doing, and then find the main road, and then go to school in January, and wait to see if Barnard had accepted her, and then wait to see if she actually wanted to go after all. But instead, her palms sprung water and slipped off the steering wheel. Pinky, can I get your number? She nodded but didn't turn to look at him. Her head might fall off, it felt that soupy. Is this what love feels like, she thought. Mateo leaned into the car window. Pinky girl, I'm not messing with you. I know this has to be on the low because of your pops, but I'm for real. However you want it, girl, give me your cell. She kept her hands in her lap. Leslie dug the little magenta purse and pulled out Pinky's cell phone. He tapped his number in. I put in Mary. That can be my code name. That way when I'm calling, no one knows it's a guy. And then he backed off a little. Good night, Les, you take care of my girl. Leslie smiled and waved and reached over to honk Pinky's horn. Now drive away, Pinky, she said under her breath. Pinky put the SUV in gear and drove. I have a boyfriend, she said as the sea air whipped around them on the highway. The air made her head feel less swimmy, kept her palms dry. You have a man, Pinky, now what are you gonna do with him? Girl, I have no idea. She drove faster, she wanted the air. She and Leslie were careening into their happiness. They were nearing Alcoa, where her father worked. Pinky thought, father, and then remembered the Catholic priest, and then she finally remembered where she knew the man in the Panama hat from, the coffin shop. He was the owner, she smiled. There was something funny about the man. He had been so mad when she touched his one, in, one wing plane back in the shop. He was nice to have given her the water in the club though. Did he remember her? Is that why he was so nice? The water had been sweet. Maybe it was coconut water. This thought made Gita laugh out loud. The laughter made her head float. Leslie glanced over at her. What was so funny? But they had already gotten to the narrow loop in the road before the aluminum warehouse. Pinky turned the wheel into the dark corner. There was a sudden blare of another car's horn. Then the invasive brights of the other car's headlights. Pinky let the wheel pull away from her. She released her hands and raised her foot off the gas. She saw the Alcoa dock as though it was a solitary arm reaching into the sea as in welcome. 
Leslie saw her friend's hand raised above the wheel. She felt the car slam into the railing, felt it lift as though alive and turn, turn until upside down. Her body stiffened in anticipation. The fare was like metal on her tongue. Hold on, she tried to scream, hold on. But the words were too slow. They hit the water like a wall. The wall gave way. Then it was dark and they were underwater and they were in a sinking car and they were upside down. Thank y'all. Good morning. Or I think it's afternoon by now, I was late, sorry. Any Trinidadians here? So you're familiar with the concept of Trinidad time, so. No, really, it's the train. I blame the train. That's my story, and I'm... That's right. Um, I'm actually a contributor to the book, and I'm also one of the co-editors. So um, it was a really exciting trip, you know, doing this, um, this collection. I remember when I first met with the publisher, uh, Johnny Temple of Akashic Books, who is actually here today. Um, and he was talking about doing something called Port of Spain Noir. Akashic Books does this collection of, um, this uh, series of crime stories called Akashic Noir. And they, they have done Brooklyn Noir, Bronx Noir, Manhattan Noir, San Francisco, London, Dublin. Anybody know Trinidad? Yeah. You know Port of Spain? How much times Port of Spain could fit into any one of those cities? Plenty, right? So I said, well, I don't know if Port of Spain has enough space, locations, to do the kind of book that you're talking about. So why don't we say, instead of Port of Spain, do the island of Trinidad? And so that's how this book was born. When you do pick it up, you'll notice that the stories are not traditional Noir, which is a kind of a gritty crime fiction, often set in urban locations. We've actually got some stories set in the country, um, in, in, in Trinidad. And um, our, our stories are not all crime stories. Some of them are more what we call atmospherically noir. And, um, but we've got a lot of good um, response. I look forward to hearing what you think of it. So without much more blather. I'll read a little bit from my story in the collection, which is called Pot Luck. Now at this point, my lead character is a guy called Trey. And Trey has what is called a tabanka. Do you know what that is? Yes. I'm sorry that you know what that is. <laughs> tabanka is a really bad, broken heart kind where you don't eat. I don't have that kind. <laughs> the kind where you don't eat and you don't want to see nobody, you don't bathe, you don't, I mean, it's terrible, terrible, <laughs> you know? So he had that tabanka. And he went to deal with his tabanka in the country by his cousin, Danny. And um, just before this scene, he and Danny were sitting down smoking some Mary Joanna, <laughs> which is a drug. I'm sure you don't know what it is, but it's, um, <laughs> it's a drug. It, yeah, I know, you've never heard of it, right? It's terrible. Uh, so he was just sitting on the... <laughs> Control yourself, boy. He's sitting on the, on the beach with his cousin smoking. And then the cousin leaves and he goes for a walk in the forest. Beyond the road, the San Susi forest towered, dim and green and forbidding. In two months, Trey had only been in the forest twice, both times with his cousin. They had gone to find a certain spring with which Danny swore had the sweetest water in the world, but they had become lost in the undergrowth and never found it. They made do with the chlorinated water piped in by the public utility, but Trey craved the fresh, untreated water of the spring. 
He stubbed the cigarette out in the sand and rose, grabbing his board and heading toward the forest in bounding strides. Bareback and barefoot, his lean, muscular body quickly maneuvered the path. His calloused feet barely registered the bumpy pitch of the Toku Road before he was in the cool mulch of the forest. It was rainy season, but the ground wasn't sodden, only damp and spongy with fallen leaves and topsoil. He had no idea where he was.